Okay, without further ado, over to you, Cholin. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Um, I see some friends uh, who are taking lunchtime off to, to join us in the session. Thank you very much. Um, hi, John Ang, haven't seen you for a long time. So um, without further ado, I'd like to just jump into uh, my observation, uh, which is a topic which is given to me by um, Onyata because of the rushness. So we, we, she's very generously told me just to do some uh, observation of, of the teak in, in fashion in particular. So um, can I have the next slide, please? I always thought, I, I always thought that Singapore is um, uh, a non-batik making uh, place and it's also uh, a non-weaving culture. So my, my research has always been in that direction, you know, us as a wearers, us as a, a user of batik. But then, you know, from time to time, I'd come across uh, something like this, the sarong weavers of Singapore. And that completely throws me off my track. Uh, all the time. So um, there's that huge gap of research that one still needs to do uh, in, in that respect. Um, uh, next slide, please. All right. So let's go back to us as uh, batik wearers. Um, this is the good old days. And uh, we know ourselves as uh, batik sarong wearers, particularly of the pakalongan uh, floral and, and, and colorful type. And I think for a lot of people who have lived in Singapore in this region long enough, a batik sarong uh, naturally becomes uh, the choice of, of clothing. So you see uh, a pageant of different people wearing sarong from the left, well, my left, and the Chetty Malacca Indians uh, wearing, you know, a pose for a, a group photo. It looks like a missionary school. And with the exception of a few ladies in all white uh, Western clothes, the rest of them seem to all be wearing beautiful sarong. And you have um, a girl, Malay. She's identified as Malay. I think uh, someone who walks into a photo studio um, and would be immediately identified uh, as a as a nat native N M Malay girl, then you have your ubiquitous Chinese nonya in sarong, and the um, Eurasian families. Again, you could see that the younger ones are wearing Western clothes, but the matriarch herself is always in a beautiful basisiran. Uh, sarong probably again from Pakalongan with the wonderful uh, tumpao of the kapala showing here. So this is Tempo Dulu. This is the past. This is the um, historical historical past. And 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 sarong wearing sarong kabaya was just uh, the fashion. You know, one would adopt. It's it's de rigueur of the time. And we're looking at end of the nineteenth century right up to. Um, 1930s, 1940s. So next slide, please. And of course, as a silhouette, like a sarong kabaya, it's got to also transform itself. It always needs to have new ways of, of presenting itself. So here I call it the sarong kabaya role models. Post-war period, it's uh, a different time. And um, people in Indonesia, people in, in Singapore, uh, Malaysia, we're looking for new identity. And naturally, I think the, the batik um, became an, an important element in self-definition. De, self and this is also the time we, if we remember that um, after gaining independence, one of the first things one needs to do is to get the economy back on track and financially, it is batik making is a way of um, organizing the manpower, uh, de definitely uh, for Indonesia, which had already been the largest batik exporters before the war. And in the post-war period, they had to do a lot of, of catching up. But this is also the time when um, women were going out to work a lot more. There are a lot more uh, um, white collar <clears throat> workers, uh, thrown into an office situation. 
but you also have um, elements like the Christian Dior new look, which is which features a smaller waist and a larger skirt. And also, in, that was in 1947, just to counteract all the doom and, and, and unhappiness caused by Second World War. Then in 1954, you have the pencil look, very thin, very slimming uh, sort of skirt silhouette. So all these um, were enthusiastically emulated in, in fashion by, by our ladies uh, in, in, in Singapore, in Indonesia, and in Malaysia. And then obviously the on, on screen, the um, stunning <clears throat> silhouette um, in, for example, the, the Madhu Tiga by B. Ramli in 1964. And you have Maria Minato uh, um, all, you know, um, um, featuring on themselves, this really figure hugging sort of um, Saran Kabaya silhouette. And Sukarno, uh, was the father of modern batik and using batik to, to generate and to promote uh, a sort of element to unify that, that um, Southeast Asian uh, look and image for, for so many people in this region. And of course, it also caught on in uh, Chinese movies, a homegrown movie industry like Cathay and, and Shaw Brothers, definitely. Um, jumping on the bandwagon to, to feature this, this exotica images of Nonias and, and Babas, then, well, uh, we can't miss Pierre Balma, who was invited to Singapore to design the um, steward, uh, as stewardess's uniform. Uh, well, he didn't invent the silhouette. He obviously only came in the 60s, in 1966, to design the, the uniform and he adapted the sort of um, suit-like uh, sarong kabaya tight-fitting uh, image silhouette for the Singapore girls. Well, it started with uh, Malaysia Singapore Airlines, but then um, later on when they split became the image of the Singapore girls. So this would be um, the modernized look, you know, the, the um, baju, the, the kabaya bandung, uh, adapted to a really tight-fitting sort of um, sarong kabaya look. So next slide, please. Um, then you have a group of people who normally traditionally wouldn't wear sarong. What does it mean for them? So this is something a lot closer to home for me. Um, I dug out <laughs> at the inspired by Onyata. I, I went and dug out all the old pictures of my mother, and here. Um, um, here she is, starting from the left, the lady sitting uh, by the waters. That's my mother at age of, um, in 1958 or so, she would have been 20, 20 uh, actually 21. Um, and her classmates uh, all training to be, to, to be teachers at TTC part-time or teaching full-time are going to TTC part-time. And here, here you are, here you are, 19-year-old um, women who in those days would have been making their own clothes or adapting the Christian Dior new look silhouette. But I think uh, for my mother in particular, she grew up in Arab street. So one of the uh, natural choice for, for fabric would have been batik. Um, <clears throat> I think in the 50s, if you were to uh, find fabrics for making clothes and you want something that is colorful and, and lively and, and youthful, I think a batik would have been the most economical choice for you for, for um, how also ubiquitous, uh, ubiquitously uh, available in say Arab street where she, she grew up. Um, the batik on, <clears throat> on the left-hand side of the screen when my mother's sitting by the water, this I believe is a kind of um, <coughs> special, sorry, special batik um, developed in the Pakalongan where they have very plain background, um, no filling uh, design, no isen isen, but just plain background, but very painterly sort of flower pattern. And they're all 
uh, designed in panels so that you can easily sew, that, sew them into round skirts like the one my mother was wearing. And the second picture features a very typical uh, kawong pattern, uh, which my mother has turned into another new look uh, dress. Um, in the last picture, my mother has the same dress as the first, but in a slightly different darker color, darker, darker shade. This is the third picture, is the portrait of uh, a classmate of hers, uh, ready to, to teach, wearing a chongsam, but the chongsam obviously was made of uh, batik uh, fabric. Um, you can tell by the way the dots have been used to to delineate the lines of, of the leaves and so on and so forth. So, so this, is, this is a group of people who normally wouldn't wear sarong, but are, um, are very keen to, to use batik uh, as an element of their new, youthful, modernized uh, Malayan uh, identity. So let's not forget about the men too. Could I have the next slide, please, Tony? All right. Men, let's not forget about them. Um, we often uh, would see men, uh, um, Malays, uh, and to some extent, the, the uh, Eurasians and the Europeans wearing uh, sarong, especially for the two other uh, categories, they would wear sarong as a relaxed form of house clothes at home. But in the, um, in the greater sort of... Um, uh, uh, promotion for a Southeast Asian, a Malayan look, the cooler, more tropicalized silhouette, um, uh, I think informed by a Hawaiian shirt for men, short sleeve, um, cut in a boxy way, so you can tuck out and, and rather than having to tuck it in, you don't have to wear a jacket. It's, it's a sort of formal or semi-formal uh, way of, of dressing to go out to play as well as to to go to work and um, the, I've taken these pictures from the range of 19 say late 50s to 1972 um, it was de rigueur for many men who who were um, living and working here in, in Malaya, in, in Singapore. So even East German defectors was noted for wearing batiks at most functions, right? Including going to VIP receptions and official functions. So I think there were little episodes like these where, where men were very, very sure of this, this um, Southeast Asian identity and for coolness, temperature wise, would insist on wearing a batik to, to very official functions. And, and obviously some embassies were not very used to it and, and they would um, take pains to, to make sure uh, people show up in suits. But there was just a, a little bit of that tug of war and a little bit of that, um, you know, funky tension going on. So um, here you have on the, the yellow, on the yellow tinged, uh, tinted uh, picture, you have um, models and, and Rima Malati, who is a film star, a singer from Indonesia, here in batik fashion, a very, very sort of tantalizing um, fashion, uh, here to, for a fundraising uh, catwalk fashion show um, to fundraise for the Tampanese housing fund. So, and, and this, the two, I think Malay Union, Malay Teachers Union, members of the Malay Teachers Union in fantastic Mara school uh, design batik um, posing, you know, outside their classroom or house. HDB house and my father here in 1967 I think 1966 or 67 in a batik shirt um, sitting outside the stadium or the badminton hall in KL uh, waiting to play badminton for for his company um, next slide please so I this is this is sort of the work in progress research I'm doing currently um, the next slide. Ah, okay. So I'm very interested in how batik shirt was um, adopted by 
a far greater number of people than I expected as a national dress or as the natural choice of dress for a, a group of uh, people who are who you would think would be the most unlikely the Chinese ethnic Chinese artists uh, who who came from China either came from China or you know sort of third generation Chinese uh, artists living in Singapore are more uh, preferring to wear batik I think mainly because of the availability of batik shirts in the market but also it's again something that helps them reinforce that Southeast Asian that the new Singapore identity that they they have adopted for themselves so this is a range of um, artists from Mr. Wu Zai Yan uh, finger painting Chinese finger painting, the very, very young Henry Chen or Chen Kezhan uh, in batik shirt, and our, you know, doyen of uh, uh, art of the 60s and early 70s, uh, Georgette Chen, um, who, who hailed from uh, Paris and, and Shanghai and who was a teacher at the Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts. And here you have a group of older Chinese artists of the Society of Chinese Artists um, doing a show and tell uh, sort of thing. And, and you, can, you, you see so quite a few of them are in wearing the batik shirt. And this is an earlier picture with Chong Su Ping. And this person looks very familiar, can't really remember, can't really identify who he is. But again, I think it's in the house gathering. Um, probably Chong Su Ping showing um, his colleagues and his his artist friends, you know, some of his latest work. Now, I want to quote from Mr. Wu Zai-Yen here. Um, he said that, well, I, I, I like, I have many batik shirts um, from Indonesia, from Thailand, um, and including also um, those made in, in Singapore. Uh, my students know that I like them, so they often give, give, them, give batik shirts to me as presents. I think I have more than 10 uh, batik shirts available for me to wear. I love to wear them because it's so convenient. I can go out in them and, and I can go out to, 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 to run errands and then yet I can directly go into a, a official function uh, in the same batik shirt. It's so convenient. I just love them. Uh, so it's, it's a sort of, I, my, my research now takes me into this um, area in Singapore history. And I, I hope to um, find something that is um, pertinent in our longer term discussion of, of Batik in, again, it, it's like creating an identity part two. I'd like to end my presentation with the last slide here. Tony, if you could just jump to my last slide. So this is Mr. Pan Shou. Um, he was the number one calligrapher, reigning calligrapher for a long time in Singapore from the 60s through 70s, 80s, right up to uh, the 90s. I mean, before he, he passed away in 1999, he was recognized as the number one calligrapher in Singapore. And he obviously loved his batik. He went everywhere. Um, every time I saw him or I had a meeting with him, he was in his batik shirt and he obviously posed really magnificently in, in his batik shirt. I have a, a sort of theory unproven why um, Chinese artists like Pan Shou, like Wu Zaiyan and, and Chong Su Ping love batik. So I, I think as a, a sort of um, a drawn uh, pattern, uh, on a piece of white cloth. It really resembles the um, process of painting and, uh, and, and the patterns and motifs that appear after dying and, and, and uh, treatment. It really looks like one is wearing a, a beautiful painterly uh, image on your body. So this is perhaps part of the reasons why the um, Chinese artists in Singapore love love to to wear them. This is this is really, um, I would say, the fashion of the seventies and eighties. It may not be uh, so uh, obvious in in our contemporary time, but um, I hope my research will continue to show how important 
batik is in in building uh, a strong sort of uh, localized tradition uh, identity um, in in our cultural milieu. So I think I'll leave it there. And um, I would love to take questions and love to have more discussions later on. Thank you. Thank you, Cholin, for sharing with us some of your preliminary research on mm, batik fashion. And it's truly very uh, inspiring to see how batik was donned uh, in those days. And as Cholin mentioned, you know, we had a session when Cholin came to my little space on North Bridge Road and I was digging up photos of my mother um, wearing non-sarong apparel, uh, where she too had uh, put uh, had 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 worn dresses, sleeveless ones, sexy, uh, um, you know, fitting uh, blouses and fancy full skirts using batik tulis. And I thought I'd share this, Charlie. Remember, you asked me uh, where did your mom get her batiks from, and I said uh, I asked her, and she said Arab Street, lah. Um, and that resonates with your little story about your mom getting her uh, batets from Arab Street. And of course, I had to ask her, Mom, yours you buy in the bill, macam roll roll, or is it tulis? And then she looks at me in this uh, this this pair of eyes that said, Please, ah, girl, you think you so wrong only wear batik tulis, is it? I dulu, I'm the first one ah, before you that wore batik tulis, no less. So hence. Um, but thanks, Cholin, once again. And um, that's the question, you know, I asked what's with moms and Arab street. And I think this is a very apt introduction with what Hafiz is going to share with us because his focus with fashion is around this area where my store is, together with other batik sellers uh, in this district of Kampung Glam. So over to you, Hafiz. All right. Thanks, Kauni, for that uh, introduction and also to provide a, a basis of background on what I'll be sharing today, which is on batik fashion through the eyes of batik businesses within Kampung Lab. Uh, Tony, yeah. All right. So yes, batik trade and fashion in Kampung Lab. Both of these are actually quite related. When we are talking about fashion, we often look at you know, how people dress, but we don't uh, focus on the businesses that are in charge of selling these batiks over here. Um, the photo that you see in this slide over here is not a batik shop or even people selling batik, but it's a photo of a family in Kampung Kaji, which is present-day Busra Street. This was taken about um, three years ago during um, Malay Heritage Centre's exhibition on the Hajj exhibition. And so I find that this um, photo of this family here, probably Javanese family, since it's in Kampung Kaji, is very interesting because it shows you the, um, the many uses of batik. And this is the form of batik that we recognise as batik as a long piece of cloth. Uh, as an undergarment or a lower garment, you might say, uh, where you see in this photo, you have sarongs being used uh, as a cradle. And in the background, you see a pagi sore, uh, probably persisir style. And then um, the ladies in front, they are wearing batik with, of course, the sarong kebaya as what Cholin has mentioned, which is the rigor of uh, at that time. And it's wearing something more like a pedalaman or uh, interior of Java, which is probably Jogja as well as Surakarta or Solo. So you see this, diversity of batik um, patterns and also um, areas just within a family photo in Kampung Kaji itself. So I'm going to explore a bit on the context of batiks in Kampung Lam itself. So Tony, the next slide. All right, so this is a diagram taken from Dr. Imran's uh, article on uh, Kampung Glam itself. So you can see that Kampung Glam is not just a tourist area. Kampung Glam is more than that. It's um, both, it's first of all, it's a royal seat of power. So with the royal family being based in Kampung Glam, naturally you have the entourage and with a royal family, you would have artisans and also uh, craftsmen and traders as well. Uh, along the area or around the area of Kampung Glam, you also have um, uh, Kampung Bugis and then you also have different Kampungs within Kampung Glam. So Kampung Glam is not just a single kampung. It's actually a macro kampung consisting of various quarters. And each of these quarters um, have a, a different specialization. Like for example, Kampung Kaji, like I mentioned, um, Busura Street was where the Hajj trade would have been concentrated on, not necessarily just in Kampung Kaji, but also in other uh, outlying areas. And Arab Street is known as Kampung Jawa. So the older generation, my late grandmother would have uh, called Arab Street as Kampung Jawa. So when I say I'm going to Kampung Glam, uh, nak beli kain eh, Kampung Jawa. Ah yes, Kampung Jawa. 
So people associate it with the Javanese and the Javanese community in Kampung Glam is a significant one and it comes from different parts of Java itself. So this could have uh, led to an uh, or more or less influence the type of batiks that were being brought in to Kampung Glam itself where you have uh, the Javanese in um, a poll done by the Javanese Singaporeans uh, um, Facebook group showed that many of the Javanese in Singapore comes from places such as Kendal, um, which is near the coastal area. You also have Pachitan, um, the Pedalaman areas such as Yogyakarta and Surakarta, as well as the coastal areas. So with all these different, this diversity of Javanese coming to Kampung Glam, naturally they brought their own styles of batik and preferences as well to this area as well. So you see both Persisir, coastal areas, as well as Pedalaman areas being um, bought, sold and worn by the people in a Kampung Glam itself. Besides that, you also have other ethnicities such as the Bugis, which would bring their own silk sarongs, check sarongs with them. And also those from the East Coast, such as from Kelantan and Terengganu would also make their way to Kampung Glam. There is actually a quarter where Jalan Sultan is, that area over there, uh, where the textile um, um, center is, was also where um, relatives um, related to the royal family in um, in um, Istana Kampung Glam, they would have come from the East Coast, from Kelantan, Pahang, as well as uh, Terengganu as well. And I have an anecdote of, I heard an anecdote from a former resident of Kampung Glam, which is Hir Johari. He's a, our resident Malay textile expert. So he shared something very interesting with me on how um, there is a distinction between how um, batik makers or batik sellers from Terengganu would sell their batik in contrast with Javanese batik. So according to him, Javanese batik will be sold at shops along Arab Street, while um, Malaysian batik, specifically Terengganu batik, were actually sold or peddled from door to door by um, women, by women sellers from uh, Terengganu. So they would actually peddle and knock from door to door and open up their wares um, at the amben or even at the corridor or the veranda for people to buy their uh, batik wares. Uh, he also mentioned there were also peddlers of Javanese batiks um, by local women, not, not necessarily from Java, but local women um, selling Javanese batiks, but they will be selling door to door in contrast to those along Arab street, which uh, tend to be managed by uh, Arab businesses, uh, Indian businesses, as well as Chinese businesses. Um, another contributing factor to the trade of batik is also the Hajj trade. So um, Singapore was the center for the Hajj um, pilgrimage, was a hub for the Hajj pilgrimage in Southeast Asia from 1830s all the way to the late 1900s, around the 1970s. During the, its heyday in the late 19th uh, century to the early 20th century, you have, again, people from all over the archipelago streaming through Kampung Glam. And uh, batik was one of um, the goods that were sold also for revenue for the um, pilgrims, as well as uh, as a form of souvenir for their relatives. After they completed the Hajj and they will be going back home to their kampongs, they would buy batik um, sauce from Java or from Malaysia in Kampung Glam to be bought as souvenirs for their relatives when they go back home. So you can see there's this diversity of batik traditions from both Malaysia and Indonesia based on the Kampung Glam trade itself. And maybe that um, is a precursor to the eclectic um, outlook of batik being sold uh, here in Kampung Glam. So, Tony, the next slide. Uh, okay, uh, since we covered this part, um, uh, the uh, next slide, please. Skip to the next slide as well. All right, so we'll focus on the OG, which are, are the batik businesses along Arab Street. So these um, uh, businesses have been um, operating since prior to the Second World War. So they have a uh, very long history in it. Uh, one of the notable ones would be uh, Toko Aljunit. So the Aljunits, uh, um, one of the Arabs uh, families who, were, who are running batik businesses in Kampung Glam itself. Uh, it's no surprise for those who done their readings on batik, you know that um, these Arab um, families do have also um, connections with coastal uh, persisir port towns, which are also specialized in batik as well, especially in quarters such known as the Kauman areas, where these are mostly comprised of Arab um, um, communities, which also deal with batik as well. So Toko Aljunit uh, is one of those um, established businesses along Arab Street. So they are uh, very important because um, their family is also in charge of importing and selling cotton 
the, the cotton um, crop itself for the making of batik. And if you can see from the advertisement on your left, uh, this advertisement was taken from Rita Harian in the 1970s. So they were not just selling batik, but also um, what stated in the article is untuk mendapatkan segala macam kain batik dan tenun Indonesia, kain songkit, batik shirt, dan blouse, dan bermacam-macam pakaian, dan hiasan dari batik. So this was in the 1970s. Bear in mind the, uh, the date you, uh, more or less, the dating itself is the, in the 1970s. So you see that they are selling batiks of different types, um, different weaves of, from Indonesia. Songkets probably sourced from uh, Trangganu, from the East Coast, and batik shirts and blouse. So even from here, you already see that batik is um, as um, a garment that is used to be cut and sewn and turned into an upper garment is already making its way into these established uh, businesses over here. Uh, but if you go to Toko Aljunit and also the next um, uh, batik shop, um, Tony, the next slide, please, which is Bashara Hill, which is also another established uh, batik business, you'll find that um, their main selling um, merchandise is still the sarongs as well as the kain panjang, which is the 2.5 meter cloths. So I would say that these um, shops over here, if you go to these shops, it's really... Um, traveling back in time a few decades ago, or even if you go to Indonesia now, where their specialization is still on the material or on the kinds itself. So it's when you go to Arab Street, you buy kain. So you are buying cloth. You are not buying shirts or you're not buying baju. When you go to Arab Street, the, um, the connection that you would think of is of course buying um, cloth itself. And these cloths are usually unstitched that can be used for wearing as a form of lower garment, like as a sarong itself. Then we move on to another shop, which is not batik, uh, which does not focus on batik specifically, but on kebayas. But I recently found something interesting about them. So um, for those who uh, visited or frequented Kampung Glam long enough, you will be aware of Ratiana, which um, specializes in kebayas. But did you know that she also sells African batik? Uh, so that's quite interesting. So besides, um, so we've already talked about Terengganu batik being sold here, um, Javanese batik from all different parts of Java. But what about uh, African batik? So uh, Ratiana is one of the few um, shops in Kampung Glam that actually does sell uh, African uh, wax prints, which um, in a way you could say that it's come full circle, you know, from Indonesian batiks to Dutch imitations of um, Indonesian batiks, then African batiks, and now it's being sold here in Kampung Glam itself. So that's quite interesting. And um, she's actually done these African prints and used them as um, material for the kebayas and also for the baju kurung. So I would say this um, kebaya, uh, Omones Ratiana represents this middle ground where her business is about almost two decades old. Uh, she's moved locations from Bali Lane to Kandahar Street, from Kandahar Street, eventually she found her home here in um, Busura Street. And um, she started using batik as, you know, as, uh, as garments. So from Bashara Hill and Aljunit, who, who specialize in still selling kain panjang and sarong, so batik in their traditional formats, you see um, Ratiana experimenting with African batik and batik that um, doesn't conform to what we identify as uh, this Malaysian Indonesian format of pakem in Indonesian, um, um, in Bahasa Indonesia where you, she starts using these uh, batik fabrics as garments, as top garments. So this uh, presents this transition. And for Rakiana itself, uh, what's interesting is also with the revival of kebayas itself. So this also led to um, younger generations or um, more younger clientele being interested in understanding and also finding out more about uh, batik itself. Then we move on to the newer uh, batik shops. So um, from shops, we move on to galleries. So I think this is um, something interesting. So we see this um, development from shops to galleries. So we have Kia's gallery, which is less than a decade old or almost a decade old. Uh, so her shop is actually quite new. Uh, and she also started off selling um, raw material. So she started selling fabrics, batik fabrics, as well as uh, woven cloth such as tenun. And from there, it moved on. Uh, she, start, uh, she realized that uh, she's, her business is not moving much with just selling these fabrics. So she started to upgrade herself and learn um, sewing as well. So she started sewing um, 
fabrics, uh, sewing fabrics and fashioning them into all these more modern, modernistic or hipster looking um, clothing as well. And quite a number of her clientele are from the art scene, like from Eka Matra as well, or from or for uh, or even uh, actors like Irfan Kasban. So those are some of the few um, personalities that actually frequent her shops and get these um, batik uh, pieces over here. So you get to see the galleries. Um, the feel of the shops itself is very different in the sense that um, batik is no longer being sold or more or less presented as you know, just basic um, cloths as garment, but they are now um, being um, presented and shown both as an art form itself. Where these batiks also, you can find that the, the patterns themselves are also taking a more contemporary look at things. And this reflects maybe the younger generation's own uh, interest in reconnecting their heritage into something that they are able to understand. Uh, it's not something that is, um, you know, when, uh, when we look at uh, maybe the traditional batik color scheme or palette, we would think it would be like bapa bapa, you know, like very uncle like that. You wouldn't want to be associated with if you are someone maybe from the younger generation, maybe in your twenties. You know, you will feel quite old or uh, a bit out of your generation by wearing these. And then you have galleries like such as Kia's Gallery, which is um, pushing batik again, promoting the art form itself, where she gets batik tulis or batik chap, but then it's presented with different a more a modern twist infusion of patterns. So it, um, the technique itself is still retained, but then you find that the, uh, the outlook in terms of the design itself and also the patterns has, uh, has changed somewhat to what maybe the younger generation want to see in the evolution of batik itself. Uh, and from Kia's gallery, of course, we now focus and zoom in onto Gallery Tokokita. <laughs> So yeah, so this is a view of uh, Kia's gallery. If you have the time, if you are in Kampung Lam, you can pay her visit at Jalan um, uh, at Sultan Gate Road. And of course, we have Gallery Toko Kita. So we'll end off here. So I'll end off my presentation here of Gallery Toko Kita. Again, um, Gallery Toko Kita, again, um, represents what I've talked about where um, batik is not being sold just as a form of garment, but it's also uh, a space. So it's a space for us to negotiate, to discuss, and um, gain a better appreciation on the evolution of batik. When we are talking about traditional textiles, one of the problems and challenges is that how do we move forward where tradition itself cannot remain stagnant? So galleries like this, like Gallery Tokokita, as well as Kia's Gallery, um, help move the discussion forward and also get um, the young ones involved in this heritage tradition where they can um, find their own, uh, or more or less it helps um, them to be exposed to these traditional fabrics, but at the same time, find their own voices within these fabrics as they negotiate between this identity of both modern, you know, this modern identity with their own heritage and their own past. So with that, I end my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hafiz. I really love uh, that you, you ended off with the idea that tradition cannot remain stagnant and, and that's why I think all of us are here as well, you know. To... I'm going to jump straight to the Q&A. Um, John, I understand there's a question from you about uh, tenun, but about weaving. Uh, so maybe we'll take that offline. I want to go to, because the focus is on batik fashion. Uh, so we can take that offline, uh, Tony. But there's a question uh, from Nizam. And I want to direct this to also Hafiz, uh, both of you. What are your thoughts on why there is a batik revival now? I mean, you've mentioned it yourself, uh, Hafiz, that you know you want to get the people, the young people, to to uh, to appreciate heritage. Uh, and there has been this revival. There are young brands coming up. You know, even as we go to a Heri uh, heritage festival at Design Orchard, you see a mushrooming of young brands uh, and even brands outside of the region using batik. Uh, as part of, uh, of, of their designs and in fashion. Why do you think there is that revival and what are the drivers? Cholin? Ha. Um, the more I look at the, uh, look at the research, I, I really think that there, there isn't much of a revival, but it's a continuity. It's in a continuum of batik um, being used, batik, uh, uh, being, you know, um, re-looked at and revisited. So I had always thought that it's sort of gone into a, a low point for Batik, maybe in the late 80s, especially when 
uh, we became affluent, you know, Singapore became one of the tigers or dragons of Asia, I don't know, um, that Batik maybe um, face a lot more competition from uh, foreign brands and obviously, you know, uh, people who are more affluent could afford to buy a Versace or Gucci or whatever. But I don't think it had gone out of fashion that much. It certainly didn't die. It's just that it, it, it had to share um, a, a marketplace with so many other things. Um, and this, this uh, more visible sort of uh, revival, I, th I think, can be attributed to the fact that uh, young people like Hafiz, you know, like Oni, you, you are reasserting your, your, your identity, right? You, are re your, you yourself are re-looking into um, Batik and, and updating it uh, for, for yourself. And so I think it's just in a constant uh, continuum. And I really, I have to say this, and I, I don't think there's ever a low point. It's just Batik being very competitive. I think Thanks. So your view is yeah, there yeah. wasn't a time even that Batik Mati, like it was, it's always been there. It's just that the continuum is, I would like to think that in the here and now, it's, it's stronger than it ever was uh, mm. Uh, mm. with, you know, new brands emerging in, in the young, uh, wanting to get to know uh, the fabric. Mm. Hafiz, mm. you were saying something? Yeah, so I agree with the points that um, Chaolin brought up. Yes, uh, Batik, one thing interesting about Batik is that it's always been dynamic. So in a sense, it's always reinventing itself uh, from, you know, from mm. Java, you have this, you know, um, branching out of different styles, then you move on to Malaysia, then they have their own version, then even up to Africa. And then back in Singapore, we are, We've not have we've not really been a center for batik making, but we've been flooded, or you know, because we are right in the in the crossroads of these you know these exchanges. So we've been exposed to all these different influences, and so we have. Uh, I think for us is that we have this eclectic outlook on things that you know die die. We need to have uh, to wear like um, Javanese batik. No, you you find we are very open to interpreting these batiks according to our own context. And with mm. regards to revivalism, I think, yes, the younger generation, they are more vocal on social media. So social media is actually a very powerful platform in raising awareness. When back then, maybe it's it's already alive and well, but with social media, it's brought to the forefront that people now see them pop up. And maybe for the younger generation as well, movements like, you know, decolonialism uh, and or even anti-colonialism as well as getting back to your roots. So you have these people trying to um, trying to embrace um, traditional fabrics as a form of storytelling, uh, which is what I'm doing as well, where a batik, I see batik as a form of um, storytelling. So whenever I go out, uh, you'll find that, you know, it's it, I will mix and match different forms of batik. It looks kind of messy to some people, but for me, I'm telling my own narrative of what I want to um, tell for today, especially when I go for my tours. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm checking the time again. It's 1.53. Um, uh, friends, I am grateful that we have at present 36, at, at one point 37 people that joined us for this uh, first event ever organized uh, by Gary Tokokita and, and my friend Tony from Annette Gallery. So I'd like you to join me in thanking uh, Hafiz and Cholin for today's session. Can you uh, uh, clap for me from where you are? Yay! And do a thumbs up and do a salam love for them. Share, them, uh, share the love with everyone. Um, I really would like to extend the session, but I understand we have uh, we have uh, other things going on with uh, other event organizers. But if you have questions that you still want us to engage with you, we are so happy to take this on. I'm quite sure Hafiz and Cholin uh, will, uh, you know, uh, accept questions. And if you want to send them to either Tony or myself via email, we'll keep the conversations going. This is a month long. Uh, event and you know we can always come back and, and regroup uh, for that matter. Um, I wanted to end by uh, not only just thanking you and thanking our uh, panel uh, speakers today but also uh, to call out to you to join us for our weekly sessions uh, every Saturday in the month of August. It's quite a feat really. It, 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 it came um, as a, as, a, as a vision that I, I wanted to be able to do this however small, however little we are uh, to be able to 
uh, to do more than just uh, buying and selling of bati. So our next session is today at five o'clock Singapore time, guys. And you look at the lineup, uh, quite terror, no? Uh, like Cholin said, uh, don't don't ignore what uh, that bati is only worn by women and sarongs uh, that cover <laughs> women. But look at this. We've got uh, Pak Rosman from Singapore who is moderating this session called Bate Nite, a collector's face-off. So Bate Nite is a different uh, style of bate. As you can see in the background, it's dotted. Uh, and Rosman it will be moderating two speakers, uh, uh, three in fact, uh, Daniel Tendayan, who is a collector, has got quite amazing collection, John Ang, uh, who is very known in the uh, world of textiles as well, from Malaysia, and of course we must balance our, our discussion with our neighbours and friends. Uh, from Indonesia, we have Pa Afif Shakur. This is at five o'clock. Now, a lot of you are asking, like, hey, why must pay money? You know, why cannot be free? I think for a few reasons. Lah. Every time things are free, right? People just sign up and they don't turn up. So we wanted to keep that. But at the same time, we wanted not just that commitment, but also your commitment to help us support the craftsmen and the ecosystem that is really struggling in this time of the pandemic, believe me. Um, so that that uh, that nominal sum will go straight to the makers, whatever we collect, uh, and we thank you in advance for this. Now, next Saturday, what are we having? Meet the makers, a chat with Batik craftsmen in Indonesia from uh, Cirebon, from Klaten in Jawa Tengah, Central Java, and from Lasem. Can you beat that? You know, and Tony, who's done these tours, yeah, Tony, he will be moderating this and also managing some translations as we go along because we acknowledge that, uh, you know, uh, we, we want to be able to honor them and to honor their language. Uh, we're here to support that best we can in the one and a half hour session. So that's also $10. And then after that, on the 21st, we have this talk show. It's very, very fun. It's called How Deep Is Your Love? For Batik lah. So we won't ask you to sing BG's song for this. Um, um, Hannah from A Nerd Store is moderating this and we're meeting three Batik Sayang members. One of them is the founder uh, to talk about their, uh, their relationship with Batik and then there's a bit of quiz. So we'll have a lot of fun with that. And then on the 21st as well, uh, on the 21st, Cholin is coming to my store, right? Cholin from 1 to 2.30. Uh, I think this session quite full already, but take a look at the PTX link. You can't bring your bate and you banter with her. You know, she's not a storyteller. She's not a fortune teller. She was going to, she's not going to evaluate your bate. She's going to look at it and we're going to tell stories with your cloth. Uh, and then we close with the most uh, exciting, I feel, session because never before have we put a Malaysian and an Indonesian on the same stage. I assure you, no, fight, uh, no fighting is going to happen because we are civil people like that. But it is a very interesting discussion about the beauty of batik from Malaysia and Indonesia. And if you think about it, you know, siapa batik, siapa cantik. Everybody's batik is cantik. And in a time like this, there are more similarities than differences. And of course, live from our session on the closing day at three o'clock, uh, Tumi, uh, Tumadi Patri is going to be here uh, doing a live uh, batik demonstration. So if you're free, you know, just walk up the steps of 757A North Bridge Road and come and take a look and view the pieces that uh, I have in my space as well. Now, before we end, uh, I wanted to bring back the photo of my father. Um, that's my father in both photos. The first one on the left is uh, in the 60s when he wore this batik shirt. And on the right was taken just a few days ago with a batik shirt that bears the same motif. Uh, I, I was speaking to the batik makers. They tell me it's Sido Mulio. But when I look at uh, the Sido Mukti, it's quite similar in some ways. So I'll keep it as Sido Mulio for now. Um, he told me he wore this uh, many years ago in his and he's photographed here on his mother's, his parents' balcony in Kampong Melayu. Um, and I asked him, um, did you get this tailored? He said, no lah, buy from a Chinese shop, maybe in Jakarta, you know. So my dad's 84 now and he has uh, dementia. Uh, but when I made this shirt for him and we have a collection of uh, nine pieces downstairs, uh, he told me, you keep uh, all my shirt, uh, my shirt all this while. So it's a really uh, lovely thing that, uh, that this shirt has uh, been able to jolt his memory uh, in a time where uh, caregiving for me uh, is a very interesting and intriguing journey as we see our old folks uh, mm. age and with Bati at that. So once again, thank you everyone. I see all the thanks and uh, some comments here. Um, and I, I wish you a very wonderful weekend, but I also hope to see your support and contribution for the rest of the events in the next four weeks. 
um, and thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Tony. Uh, thank you, Makanpedia, for supporting this. Uh, terima kasih. Thank you, and matur nuwun.